Well, good morning, saints. Well, some of you are obviously not sure. I hope you qualify that. A group of Sunday school children are having this Sunday school lesson, and they were being taught about saints. And so to help them, the Sunday school teacher said, well, if you look around the windows, all the people pictured in the windows, they are all saints. So the kiddies go home, and the one little boy was there, and his mum and dad said, well, what have you learned about today in Sunday school? He said, I've been learning all about saints. So they said, well, who or what is a saint? And he said, the saint is someone that the light shines through. So, good morning, saints. <laughs> Praise God. It's a great privilege, as always, to be able to preach and share God's word. And I count it a privilege to be here this morning with you. Thanks to Pastor Wayne here for his invitation. We didn't, I'd like to say we met somewhere nice and spiritual, but we didn't. We met in Starbucks, which is Wayne and Kathy's second home and my second home also. I praise God. Now it's good to be with you here in Sebastopol. Though the older I get, it's good to be anywhere. That's so I look. Normally when I come to preach God's word, very often it's just a couple of days before I get to preach the word that God gives me the word. But at the time of this invitation, God, yes, God within the next day or so as they prayed, were just planted this word within my spirit. And I thought, no, this isn't right. And several times they've gone to change it. And God says, no, this is what I want preached. So this is the gospel that we're going to share this morning. If you want to hope to hang the message on, it's in Psalm 103 and verse 3. It says, who forgives all your sins and heals some of your diseases. No, it says, he forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. But the actual message is to be found in 2 Kings, in 2 Kings chapter 5, and the verses 1 to 15. And it's a well-known story there of a well-known character, Naaman. And in 2 Kings there, chapter 5, we meet Naaman for the first time. He's a man of some standing. He's a commander in the king of Aram's army. The Bible tells us that he's a great and a valiant soldier, well thought of in the king's household. And because the king held him in such high esteem, no doubt he lived a good life. He lived in a big posh house. He had this year's model chariot outside the door, held in high esteem. But there's a black cloud in his blue sky. There's a note of discord in his seemingly harmonious life. For amongst all the other things that we learn about Naaman, he also had leprosy. In verses 2 and 3 of this chapter, we read there of a young Israelite girl. Now she's been captured by the king of Aram and taken back. She's been taken from the bosom of her family. She's been taken to a strange land where she doesn't know anybody, probably doesn't know the language. But there's a lot to be learned from this young girl. I've actually spoken just on this young girl at one time because I saw so much from her. She's been put to work as a servant for Naaman's wife. Now despite being from her family and her friends, she doesn't bear any grudge against Naaman. Neither does she blame God for the situation in which she finds herself, which is very easy for us to do. Sometimes we're in a difficult situation, we blame everybody and everything, including God. But this young girl, I found, is an example to all of us. For in a difficult situation, her compassion born of her faith in Jesus Christ shows through and she gives testimony to that faith because she says if only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria and he would cure him of his leprosy what a girl I don't know if I could be so generous of spirit if I'd been taken from my family to a strange land put to work as a slave on hearing that my master had leprosy I think particularly the old man in me would have said well best to let him know his family gets it as well but this young girl's shining example she says no if only he would see the prophet who's in Samaria he would cure him of his leprosy now Naaman not only needs physical cleaning and physical healing, he needs spiritual healing also. 
And it's in comparisons between leprosy and sin. Sin, like leprosy, is a deadly disease. Leprosy is loathsome, it's polluting, and it is a deforming. And those suffering from it will eventually be separated from the rest of society. And those who are deformed and polluted by sin will one day be separated from those that have been cleansed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Sin, like leprosy, is infectious. If you stay in the presence of either of them for very long, you stand a very real risk of being affected by them. As we know, lepers were separated from the rest of society. They were placed in leper colonies. And when they went down the street, their little bell ring and said, unclean, unclean, giving the clean people time to move out of the way. And as Christians, we need to separate ourselves from the world. Not that we don't speak or commune with them, but we can't take part in a lot of the things in which the world does. We have to take care of the things we watch on television, the type of books and magazines that we may read, the conversations that we get engaged in. We need to be careful of the company we keep. Why? Because we have been washed spotless by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it is incumbent upon us to make sure that we remain that way also. Second Peter 3 verses 13 and 14 say, In keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Sin and leprosy can be hereditary. You know, we are living in a day now where we are in a third, perhaps sometimes even fourth generation of unchurched families. We've got children, parents, grandparents, and sometimes great-grandparents who have no knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never set foot inside a church other than for hatches, matches, and dispatches. Again, sin, like leprosy in its early stages, is an anesthetic disease. See, leprosy doesn't bring immediate pain and suffering to the sufferer. And neither does sin. But the day will come when those who have not been cleansed for their sin will suffer the full agonies of their sin. And death for them is no relief because it's a living death. We're told that in Revelation 20.10 tormented day and night forever and ever. And I don't care what the W's preach. This is what the word of God says. Tormented day and night forever and forever. Go back to Naaman. In verse 4, Naaman goes to see the king and he tells him what this young maid has told him. And because he's so well thought of, the king gives him permission to go off and to see God's servant. Not only does he wish him farewell and send him off, but he gives him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten sets of clothes. And he also gives Naaman a letter to the king of Israel as well. And he says, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you that you may cure him of his leprosy. Naaman makes a number of mistakes and this is his first mistake. And there are many people like Naaman who think that they can buy their way into heaven, if not by money, but by their good works. If my salvation depended on my paying for it or on my good works then I'm afraid I'd be going to a lost eternity but praise God it doesn't and God doesn't want payment how can you pay somebody who owns everything already 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19 it was not with silver and gold that you were redeemed but with the precious blood of Christ and Ephesians 2 verses 8 there says for it is by grace that you have been saved not by works so that no man can boast. Verse 7 gives us Naaman's second mistake. In looking for his healing from his leprosy, he went to the wrong person. Now despite the servant girl having told him that he needs to go and see Elisha, this man of God, Naaman goes to the king of Israel. And you know, this morning there will be those in Sebastopol here that have at some time heard the gospel message. 
They've been told where they know they need to go to find the peace and satisfaction that they lack in their lives. Yet, they still choose to look in all the wrong places. They're looking into drugs, they're looking into alcohol, they're looking into Ouija boards, they're looking into all forms of the occult. Looking for healing for their, for their pain that's in their lives. In verses 9 and 12 of this chapter, we read that Naaman eventually comes to Elisha's house. And he just stops outside the door. And Elisha sends a message to him saying, well go and wash in the Jordan seven times and you're going to be healed. But Naaman goes away angry, saying, I thought that he was going to come out, stand there in front of me, lay his hands on me, call upon his God, wave his hands over me, and I'm going to be healed. Here's Naaman's third mistake. Naaman believed that because of his high office in the king's household, that by merely standing at Elisha's door, he could command healing. In his arrogance, he not only tries to dictate where the healing should take place, but how it should be done. By Elisha coming out and waving his hand over him and saying, be healed. How many times upon witnessing to someone over the years have you heard these words? I'll do it in my own way and in my own time. <coughs> nothing new, nothing different. Naaman, being sort of character, he is, continues to argue. He loves a good argument. but He then says, well, what's wrong with the rivers in Damascus? They are far better than any of the waters that you have here in Israel. Can't I go and bathe in one of those? Now, Naaman is obviously an intelligent man. And he knows that the River Jordan doesn't have any healing properties to cure his leprosy. <coughs> How does he know that? Because if there were any healing properties in the river, there would be no lepers in Israel because they'd all be diving in the water and coming out clean. But God isn't looking for Naaman's intellect and he's not looking for his understanding. What he wanted from Naaman then and what he wants for us now is our obedience. There are times when we simply don't understand why God is leading us in a particular, particular direction. We don't understand why we're going through a particular experience. But it's not for us to know. It's within God's plan and purpose. And it's times like this is when our faith is tested and strengthened. Very often it isn't the particular trial we're going through. It's the length of the trial that drags us down. But it's a time for us to be tested. Naaman's journey from Samaria to the River Jordan would accomplish a couple of things. First, it would test the strength of his faith and during the journey it would give him time to think about it as well. It would test his sincerity, his humility and his obedience. See, washing in the Jordan was simple and straightforward. There's nothing complicated about it. So he had no real valid excuse for not doing it. And coming to faith in Jesus Christ is just the same. It's not difficult. There are no exams to pass. No difficult rituals to go through. It's simply acknowledging that Jesus Christ died for us and rose again. Say, no, Jesus, I acknowledge it. I'm a sinner. I repent of it. And I ask you into my heart and my life. But Naaman, be a Naaman, once again throws his toys out of the pram. He goes off in a rage. I feel sorry for this guy because when I was younger, particularly I had anger issues myself. His gifts of gold and silver have been ignored. God is not interested in the size of your bank balance. If he was, no one, I should imagine, with the exception perhaps of Pastor Wayne, would be here this morning. His person is being ignored. Acts 10.34 Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive, that God is no respecter of persons. The NIV, which is the Northern Ireland version, 
or nearly inspired version, depends what you say. God does not show favoritism. God doesn't think any more of the successful businessman than he thinks of the person living on the streets. God is not impressed by our positions in society. Now Naaman's preference or his self-choice has been ignored. His preference was that he should bathe in one of the rivers of Damascus, the Farpa or Barna rivers. In Arabic the names mean cool, in Hebrew it means clear. The Greeks called the Abana River the Golden Flowing River because it was a fertile place. There was orchard upon orchard all along the mountains and vineyards every side of the river. Luxurious vineyards. It's clear, cool water would flow down from the mountains through Damascus, the oldest city in the world, and on through all the towns and the villages that had sprung up along the banks. It was a beautiful place. In contrast, the River Jordan was little more than a muddy stream. No real signs of civilization anywhere along the banks, and some coarse, rough vegetation was the only thing that was there. In Isaiah 53 and verse 2, the prophet speaking of Jesus says these words, He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. And when I looked at this, I thought, this is not unlike the River Jordan. There was a time in my life when, like Naaman, my preference was for the golden flowing rivers. The golden flowing rivers of worldly pleasure. And believe me, I immersed myself in them, thinking that I'd found the place of my satisfaction but I remain dissatisfied and just like Naaman and if I'd stayed in that my place of preference I wouldn't be here this morning and if Naaman had stayed in his place of preference he would have remained leprous Naaman continues to fight against it for a while but then in verse 14 we see there comes a time when Naaman gives up his self choice he comes to the place where God's servant Elisha has told him he's got to come. And he bathes in the River Jordan. There came a time also in my life when I gave up my self-choice. And I came to the place where God's servant told me that I needed to come. To many, in comparison with the Damascus River, the Jordan was indeed a place without majesty. There was no beauty there. But to Naaman it had both. At the river Jordan he met with the king of kings. He received healing both physical and spiritual. And all of those that have come to Christ have seen his majesty. We have seen his beauty. We have found love and peace and tenderness. Compassion, understanding, grace and healing for our pain. And furthermore cleansing from our sin. And as Naaman washes seven times in the Jordan, as God's servant had told him to do, his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. In the King James it says, his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. In John 3, it says, Jesus says, you must be born again. And effectively, this is what's happened now to Naaman. His flesh has been renewed like that of a young child. But then there's a lovely, a lovely verse in verse 15. He says, Now I know there is no God in all of Israel. There is no God in all the world except in Israel. And he could only say that if his heart had also been renewed. Naaman has now been cleansed without and within. In Ezekiel 36, 26, God says, I love this verse, God gives us many, many promises. But this is a promise that's meant a lot to me over the years and still does every time I read it. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Wow, what a promise. What a promise. Today, we can receive a new heart and a new spirit 
if you were unsaved, it's a, a heart that's been cleansed from its sin. Cleansed of all the sins of the past. A heart renewed with love and faith. A spirit that will guide you, teach you, strengthen you, and comfort you in the days that lie ahead. A new heart and a new spirit. Sometimes when we've been on the road for a long time, things get, our senses get a bit dulled, the spirits get a bit dulled. We no longer praise, we no longer worship, we no longer witness, we no longer do the things that we used to do. Not long ago in my home church, I was preaching on the letters to the churches and speaking about the loss of first love. And it's very easy for us when we've been on the road for a long time. Loss of first love. There was a thing that struck me as I was reading through Revelation. I've read it many, many times. I speak a lot on Revelation. But when the church at Ephesus lost their first love, God called them to repent. And it's the first time I realized that when God sees the loss of first love, he sees it as a sin, because the only thing you repent of is sin. And that really broke me. I knew it offended God, and it hurt God, but I never realized until then, if there's a loss of first love, it's a sin. We need to repent of it, and then ask God to apply the forgiveness of Calvary to it. If you're in that situation this morning, perhaps you need a new spirit within you. God will give you a new spirit to praise him, the one who forgives some of your sins. No, the one who forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases. Whenever I preach God's word, I always like to give an opportunity, if it is an opportunity for, for ministry, if you need healing, spiritually, physically, emotionally, if you just want to rededicate your life to God, there's an opportunity this morning. Sure, pass away, we wouldn't be too glad to come and pray with you. Take that opportunity, please don't leave without speaking to Wayne and Kathy or to one of us before you go. May God bless you through the rest of this day. May he anoint you and pour out his blessing upon you so that when you go out, it's not for a feel-good factor, it's so that you can become a blessing and anointing to those you will come in contact with through this week. May God bless you.